Namaste, I am Dr. Krishna Koirala, ENT surgeon from Pokhara. Today we will be discussing about examination of nose and PNS. They have to be examined together because mucus of nose and PNS is the common mucosa. So today's uh, subject will be Dr. Anmol Laimil Sani. I will be describing something about the position of the patient and position of the examiner in, in examination of ear, nose and throat and the light source. This is called bull's eye lamp as we have already described. The position of bull's eye lamp should be at the patient's left side because the light should come from the right side of the patient and, and the examiner is wearing his head mirror on, the, on his right eye. It has to be well focused at you know how to focus the head mirror. Bull's eye lamp it has a light of around 100 watt bulb. It might be heat or it might be hot. Therefore, it should be kept slightly away from the patient around at one feet distance and should be slightly posterior so that there will be no heat for the patient. It might not, uh, damage the patient's shoulder and it should be slightly at the level of the patient's shoulder so it will be easy for the examiner to uh, examine the patients. So today we will discuss about examination of the nose. So first uh, to discuss I uh, will explain you about the use of head mirror for examination of the ear, nose and throat. This is called bull's eye lamp. Why is this called bull, bull's eye lamp? Because the eye is big. So this is called bull's eye lamp. So this is the light source for us, light source. And this is the head mirror which is the reflecting source. The head mirror contains the concave mirror which is around 9 cm in diameter. This diameter is 9 cm and the hole is around 2 cm. So this we have to fix on the, on the head. This is the head band. Okay, so we have to use the head, we have to just make it clear that this strongly fits in your uh, head and the scalp. So now I will start using the head mirror. So this is the head mirror, this is the light that gets uh, comes to the head mirror and from the light source and that is reflected on patient's examination side that is either nose or the throat or the ear. So the distance between the patient and the uh, examiner, patient and examiner should be around 25 centimeters okay, because the focal length of this uh, head mirror is around 25 centimeters. This is the concave mirror already told. The basic concept of concave mirror is to focus the light. Now you can see this is the concave mirror and this is focusing light on his nose now because we are trying to examine the nose. Therefore, just you have to focus the light well, otherwise it will be difficult for you to look on the corners and depths. We will start with the examination of the external examination of nose that is osteocardinal spermo of the nose. The patient has to take off the specs. If they are using the specs, the patient has to take off the specs, otherwise we cannot see it properly. So on to visualize the examination of nose. Uh, first I look for the skin on the over the nose and the parietal sinus area that is in the mid face region. You can see the nose, the parietal area, the skin seems normal. There is nothing in the skin. The skin has to be even seen for scar marks. There, is, there are no scar marks and thickness of the skin, the skin thickness seems normal. It is normal because by palpation you can find out the thickness otherwise by inspection you can simply see why there in the in the skin. Then you have to look for the osteocardinus framework in the nose. The nose has to be seen for its structural deformity. If there is any structural deformity, like the nose might be straight, might be uh, deviated to right or left side, or might be depressed or elevated. The depressed nose is called as shadow nose. Okay, shadow nose is basically depression at the dorsum, and the elevated nose is called as hump nose. Hump in males is also minimal. Minimal hump is males is normal. Hump in males is normal and on females is not normal. So we have to differentiate male and female nose from examination as well. The male nose, see he has some hump that is normal and female nose has to be short, straight and stout. Okay, short, straight, stout. With this angle is slightly more. Okay, this is a columnar angle, so it's slightly more. But males, that it has to be slightly uh, hump. You can see hump and the saddling from the side. Okay, it will be easy to visualize. And the deviation to lateral side can be seen from the posterior aspect. Therefore, you have to go towards the posterior part of the patient, back to the patient, and you have to see from the up. So I will just go towards the back. So this is how to visualize for the deviations exactly from here. You have to look from here, and you should look at the nasal tip, and this is the nasal and nasal tip. So this should be straight most of the times. But if it is bent like this or like this and this is the bent nose okay you can even see the crook nose and at the same time you can see if there is proptosis also in the eyes so in the, if the eyeball is bulged out then you can see from here okay from like this 
So this is the exact examination uh, for the bend in the lateral aspect that is either towards the right or towards the left. Okay. So this is all regarding external examination, external inspection of the osteoclastic framework. Then there are two important things that we have to examine in the eyes also. Eyes only told one is proptosis that has to be examined from the back and you have to examine for the telecanthus. Telecanthus basically means the increased distance between the two canthi. So usually there should be one eye should be fitted with the two middle canthi, that is normal. But that depends on different races, especially in the uh, Aryans, that is, that, that is usually small, big, that, that is narrower. And in Mongols, that is slightly like wider. So sometimes that becomes that is hereditary and racial also, but it not, should not be very uh, like wide. So widening of the middle canthi, between the two middle canthi occurs when the person is having sometimes ephemeral polyp or some expansion lesions in the ethmoids. Okay, or even in children when they develop an ethmoidal polyps in children. So that has some significance. So any expansion region over here might lead to telecanthus. So this is the distance between two middle canthi, okay? So that has to fit around one or more eye over there. So now uh, on palpation, suppose then you have to first palpate the again osteocardinus framework. You have to palpate here if there is any tenderness, okay, for then pain, okay, so first you have to palpate for the temperature, you have to look the temperature, look for temperature and you have to just palpate for tenderness if there is any tenderness in the nasal area. Suppose when the patient has some form of furuncle here, then it might be tender, okay. So you have to palpate for thickness of the skin already told and you have to palpate for the bony counters if there is any cracking sound or like that. Suppose, but when the patient comes with fracture, suspected fracture of nasal bone, then you did not palpate, palpate here. That is called palpation for the nasal cavities. That is almost comprehensive when the patient is having trauma because the, when the patient is having trauma, then there might be fracture. So that fracture might be undisplaced fracture. So when the fracture is undisplaced, if you just move it right like that, then undisplaced fracture might be displaced one, and the patient might develop the bleeding or CSF leaf, or the fracture might be displaced. Okay. So just simply palpate for temperature and tenderness here. Then you have to palpate for the infrabrittal margins because this, this area has to be palpated for, okay, you have to palpate for infrabrittal margins that have to be normal. So if there is any step deformity when the patient is having trauma or when there is any thickness or when there is blunting, then you have to think of some mass in the maxillary sinus that is pushing off the, the infrabrittal margin up or your mass might be in the orbit as well, okay. Then you have to go more down then to palpate the uh, this area, okay, this is the area of the maxillary sinus and going more down, you have to look for, again on inspection, to your mouth please, then you have to look for the gingival level sulcus, just to look and sometimes you have to palpate there also if there is blunting. Suppose in elderly individual, individuals, blunting of the, in the uh, nasal level fold, okay, or nasal level sulcus signifies some form of maxillary sinus swelling might be malignant or might be benign, but when there is swelling in the maxillary sinus, then that might, that might blunt the gingival uh, labial sulcus or gingival buccal sulcus, this area might be uh, blunted. Now comes the examination of PNS. It is better that the examination of, external examination of our parental sinuses to be carried out, carried out at the same time of examination of the external part because external points of the, max, the maxillary sinus, frontal sinus and the entry ethmoids lie in the just be beyond the skin, beyond the skin, so it is better to palpate at the same time. So we will palpate for the frontal sinus first. Frontal sinus is palpated in the superior medial aspect of the orbit. Superior medial aspect of the orbit, this is the superior medial aspect, that is palpation for the floor of the frontal sinus, this is the floor, which has to be simply palpated, okay, and just see for patient's facial expression. When there is pain, then there is some form of facial expression changes, okay. Palpate here, then palpate to opposite side, support the head, try to apply equal pressure. And as you know, the frontal sinus, the entry valve is thick bone, okay, I mean, entry and posterior tables. Therefore, it cannot be simply palpated here. If you palpate here, there will be no tenderness, but you have to tap here. Okay, tapping here, there is to tenderness, but palpating at the floor of the frontal sinus is to tenderness. Now we'll come to the next uh, the ethmoid sinus. The posterior ethmoid sinus cannot be palpated. So there are two sinuses that cannot be palpated, they are 
pustulated moids and the sphenoid sinus. They can be palpated. So, we will palpate the entire moids at the medial to the medial canthus. This area and this area apply equal pressure over here, equal pressure, okay, and palpate all. You can simply palpate both the sides together with the uh, with the two fingers, okay. This is for the ethmoid sinus. When there is pain, then you will see for facial expressions. In palpating for the maxillary sinus at the canine fossa, this is the canine fossa. You have to palpate at the canine fossa again. You can either palpate both the sides together with, with the same force, or you can palpate one first followed by another. You have to support the support the head, okay? So similar like that. This is regarding palpation of the maxillary sinus, okay? Then again, as I told, palpation of the gingival sulcus and the patient has to open uh, his mouth and you have to palpate, you have to just look for the palate. If there is any widening or there are loose teeth, at the same time you can palpate there. Okay, you have to palpate the gingival level sulcus and buccal sulcus also. Now, I'm not palpating because he's not having any problem, it seems over here. So with that, we'll finish the external examination. Now we'll move to the function of the nose. So because the tendency is go from anterior posteriorly, because the anterior part has to be joined first, followed by the posterior part, okay? Then the examination of the function is nasal patency test. The nose has function of breathing, okay? Function of air circulation. So you have to look for patency of nose. The nose has to be patent. So patency of nose can be examined by different techniques. But the most common techniques, two techniques used are one is cotton wool test. Cotton wool test and next is cold spatula test. Cotton wool test is simply like if you uh, keep a cotton wool in the nose, okay, just outside the nose and ask the patient to breathe out. If it is patent, then at least there will be some form of movement. So this is basically a subjective uh, form of testing, doesn't have much of the object, objective role. The next is the cold spatula test. Name itself signifies cold spatula. Why cold spatula? Because the air that is breathed out is warm. Therefore, if it makes some form of uh, mist in the cold spatula. So the name is cold spatula test. Okay, now it is the cold spatula. This is tongue depression. And ask the patient to gently breathe from the nose. Okay, patient should not breathe very hard. Okay, very hard. So I'll keep the, this is the cold spatula or this is the tongue depression. I'll keep in patient's Burmian border, upper Burmian border at the exact side here. And ask the patient to simply breathe. Breathe simply, please, breathe gently. Then I'll see for the Mist formation over here. You can see mist over here. Again, you can see misting over here. Okay, mist can be seen on both the sides when the patient is having patent nostrils. The only thing uh, for this is suppose when the patient is having decreased misting, how do you know the patient is having decreased breathing? It is difficult to know the decreased misting. Therefore, it also doesn't have much of the objective sensitivity. So these two tests, basically nasal patency test, that is the function of nose and that is most of the time that is subjective, okay? And the most objective tests are the rhinomanometry test, which are objective tests of nasal patency because they signify the amount of breathing, amount of air passing out and the level of obstruction as well. By this, we cannot know the level of obstruction. Might be anterior nose, might be posterior nose, okay? So most of the times what happens is the posterior nose is more patent than the anterior part because the posterior nose nasal part is more roomy more room in. Therefore, when the patient is having posterior DNS, then there might not be much of nasal obstruction. But when the patient is having anterior DNS, there might be much of the nasal obstruction. Okay? This is very important. The anterior nasal valve area lies near the anterior end of the inferior turbinate. I think you know regarding that. Finishing the nasal patency, we'll move towards the nasal vestibule. So the nasal vestibule examination is performed with the patient, okay, patient's Nasal tip lifted upward by the help of thumb. So this is my thumb. Okay, then I'll just apply some force here and I'll look for the nasal vestibule. Nasal vestibule, you know, has a floor, it has a it has two sides and it has roof. So this is a floor. These are the two lateral sides and this is the roof of the vestibule. So nasal vestibule can be so on examination of vestibule uh, nasal vestibule, you can see the bibrish that is that is the here. Vestibule is defined as nasal vestibule, the hair lined area of the, of the nasal cavity. Okay, so you can see, uh, suppose when there is any debris, any discharge in the floor, you can see in the, so you can see the discharge, you can see the, the lateral wall. Okay, if there are any furuncles again, you can see the lateral wall, furuncle having been there. The medial wall is the lower part of the nasal septum. So if there is cordial dislocation of septum, then 
you should be able to see the caudal dislocation of the septum. In this case, it doesn't have caudal dislocation. Then the roof is also examined, roof is difficult to examine. Then if there is any DNS deviated septum, we can see from here. I can see uh, the deviation on the right side. There is DNS to the right side, but there is a simple DNS. Okay? 